joining us here. Hi, I'm Louis Gutierrez. I'm the alumni relations manager um, here at UCSF. And um, today we have uh, Kathy Bonaccini with us. Uh, just some quick housekeeping rules. We will be taking questions at the end of the event. So if you do have any questions, please go ahead and um, enter those into the Q&A. And I'm going to introduce Dorla Cantu. She is our committee chair for the speaker series. Uh, go ahead, Dorla. Thanks, Louis. Hello, we're so glad you could join us today. Our speaker, as Louis mentioned, is Kathy Bonaccini. Uh, she is a physical therapist and she will be talking about how aging affects our strength, balance, flexibility, and endurance, how physical therapists can guide us and how much is too little and how much is too much exercise. Uh, Kathy has both her bachelor's and doctorate in therapy from the University of Kansas Medical Center. She's a board certified physical therapist, geriatric clinical specialist, and orthopedic clinical specialist. An exercise enthusiast, Dr. Bonaccini has incorporated her love of movement into her career as a physical therapist for over 30 years. She began her career in acute rehab at Rancho Los Amigos in Los Angeles, working with outpatient geriatric and spinal injury patients. She continued her career as an outpatient orthopedic therapist and as a supervisor in the Midwest and Southern California. As a UCSF home healthcare physical therapist, Dr. Bonaccini traveled to homebound patients to restore their function for nine years. Currently as the lead physical therapist at the Lakeshore location of UCSF faculty practice, Dr. Bonaccini works with a variety of orthopedic patients with particular interest in the geriatric population. She teaches a weekly class specializing in extra exercise and postural training and assists in UCSF Department of Physical Therapy PT classes. Dr. Bonaccini's clinical practice has centered on evidence-based treatment for orthopedic musculoskeletal and neurological patients. As a dual orthopedic and geriatric clinical specialist, she has a special interest in the clinical management of the older adult to optimize functional abilities, and she treats a wide variety of musculoskeletal injuries. Dr. Bonaccini thrives in the challenge of the complex patient care. Dr. Bonaccini. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, everyone, 170 of you. <laughs> and here I am in my little room all by myself. Um, thank you so much for joining and joining me. And also, um, I appreciate very much your interest in um, uh, physical, keeping physically active, especially in this world of ours, um, where we have been sheltering in place for over a year. Um, so I will talk about um, that um, and, its, and effect, its effect too. So I do feel like this talk is especially pertinent in um, these times. So the first thing I'd like to do is talk about, oh, it just slipped over. Um, I wanna talk first about um, the effect of mobility and the importance of mobility in people over the age of 65. And then I'm gonna um, teach you and show you with, with um, an inside view of physical therapy and some of the things that I do just about every day, either on telehealth or in person. Um, we're currently 50%, I'm 50% in person and 50% um, um, uh, telehealth. Um, but there's some functional tests that we can absolutely do online and I'll show you some of those um, and how we determine physical activity in the older adult. And then lastly, um, I wanted you to have a very good understanding of what the exercise guard guidelines are and how they came to be um, for older adults. So um, um, in the very nice introduction, um, very um, much appreciated. Um, I've been a physical therapist for 33 years and um, I am preaching to the choir here um, where I am a lifelong learner. So um, I never, never stopped learning and growing. And um, I've enjoyed um, 13 years here at UCSF um, begin, and uh, almost 10 of those were in the home health care setting, going to homebound patients throughout the city of San Francisco to help them to re regain their function. My biggest passion, I would have to say, is optimal aging. And what optimal aging is, is um, the capacity to function um, in 
all the domains. It's physical, it's cognitive, emotional, spiritual, um, social, um, to one's satisfaction despite um, one's medical condition. So it's not in lieu of, but it's in spite of and um, having the best quality of life. So um, thank you for allowing me to um, talk about my passions. Let me um, uh, give you an outline. First thing I want to do is talk about the effect of physical activity and sedentary behavior. And then let's talk about the, phys the physical and physiological effects of aging. And um, then we'll um, go into um, what a physical therapist does and some testing and I'll, you guys will test yourselves also. And then we'll talk about the guidelines that the CDC and the American Academy of uh, Medicine and um, also the American Heart Association recommends. We're all on the same bandwagon here. All right, so um, first slide, um, it, it should be no uh, surprise to everyone um, that there's lots and lots of evidence of the ben benefits of physical activity. Um, this has been available since the 1950s. We know that there are lower rates, very strong evidence for lower rates of all causes of mortality, um, including all of these um, uh, uh, different issues and strong evidence for high, higher level of um, fitness, bone health, um, function, um, and cognitive health. Um, but this Lancet article um, basically did a physical activity policy framework. Um, so they um, spelled um, physical, physical activity promotion, um, global planning, leadership, um, how to train, and surveillance of this program. And we will, um, uh, um, the results of that um, was adopted by the World Health Organization, and they have established guidelines, which we will um, talk about in, um, in just a little bit. Um, so again, it's no surprise that exercise helps um, patients and all people, patients or not patients, um, with cancer, cardiovascular disorders, endocrine disorders, um, falls, you know, one out of four um, uh, Americans over the 60, 65 years um, will fall, um, uh, GI disorders, musculoskeletal disorders, neuromuscular disorders, obesity, the lungs, um, and um, transplants. So um, exercise, just overwhelming, oh, overwhelming um, uh, proof that it helps. But let's talk about what happens when we lead a sedentary lifestyle and we have been sheltering in place. So we are a little bit of couch potatoes at this point um, or, or have been most of us. Um, the World Health Organization um, has um, established that 60 to 85 percent of people in the world lead sedentary um, lifestyles. And why is that? Um, you know, it can be like changing patterns of like transportation or um, increased technology. We're sitting at our computers, just urbanization in general. Um, um, and they also agree that sedentary lifestyles increase all causes of mortality. Um, so um, we are all on board and all on the on the same same page here. Um, and chronic diseases um, caused by cardiovascular diseases, the leading leading and diabetes and obesity are the leading causes of death in every part of the world. Sub-Saharan Africa, I believe. It's infectious diseases, although that may change in some areas in the world of COVID. However, I really want to point out that all these chronic diseases can be helped by exercise. So um, uh, I love, love this um, heat, heat map. Um, and this is um, from uh, Lancet in 2016. And basically what it, what it shows is that when you um, so on the y-axis you have, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, the, the daily sitting time, the more you sit, um, the redder it gets. 
and that this is inactive and this is towards moderate to the um, to vigorous um, activity. So as you move from red to green, um, the the um, all, all cause mortality decreases. Um, and this is done with um, hundreds of thousands of of of, uh, of people. But um, here, what I want to point out is um, when you can't help it, and you've had a hospital stay. Um, if you're over 70, um, one third of patients um, older the older than 70 um, become disabled after hospitalization, and 50%, about half, um, um, have, even though they've recovered from their pre-illness levels of functioning, um, um, become uh, have some sort of ADL um, uh, difficulty. So that can be maybe they're walking now with a cane, or um, it could be that you're, you're, um, you're walking or you need help um, taking a shower, that kind of thing. So this is with any kind of hospitalization. So this could be, um, for example, um, you know, uh, something very serious like open heart surgery, but also for like metabolic um, um, syndrome issues or um, UTI, um, whatever you're admitted to for a short stay in the hospital. Um, so um, what has been thought and established is that um, your um, the level of um, no, and no matter what, if you get better with whatever you're in the hospital, the recovery is important. So um, the recovery is discordant with the the uh, level of function. So you function, your function is still even though you got better. And you know your issue that you went into the hospital is now um, resolved. You still um, have um, some residual functional loss. So it is, you know, really that important, right? Let's talk about um, the physical effects of aging. And um, this graph um, is an old graph, but I really liked it because it's the first time you kind of, they they um, did. Um, categorize the different parts of your life. So when you're moving a lot and you're more, you know, vigorous um, uh, and the younger that you are, they call it the fun stage, right? So the fun stage, um, you can do whatever you want anytime um, and, um, you know, go out and go for a run um, whenever you want to. The functional stage when you are less vigorous and you're older um, is you are at risk for mobility disability. Um, the frailty stage is where you need some assistance with activities of daily living. And the failure stage is that you are um, completely um, dependent and bed bound. So I'm gonna give you bad news and good news. So that is the bad news, my friends. However, the good news is this, that at whatever functional level you are, a physical activity program can change this trajectory, um, no matter what stage of disability you are. So this slope, um, this graph is similar to the, the previous graph, um, except for um, the y-axis is physical function instead of vigor, but you can see how it um, absolutely changes the graph. Um, there is um, evidence, which I'll show later, that really the more disabled you are, no matter what exercise you do, you will benefit um, even, even more. Um, uh, so anyway, um, all that to say, this is the, the fantastic news and the things that I, that I do every, every day. All right, I like to go around the circle here and we'll discuss um, each of these different parts of our body. Um, as we age, what happens to our strain, flexibility, balance, and oxygen consumption. And let's talk about our strength first. So as we age, we, um, we it, it, this, is a, this is a study that was done a long time ago, the first time you know, that it was really established, um, uh, where they took uh, about 700 subjects 
and um, from the ages of uh, 20 to 94, and they study their concentric and eccentric peak torques um, in their different body parts. And what they determined is that after the age of 30, we if you don't exercise, we naturally lose about 1% of our muscle mass per year. <clears throat> after the age of 60, we lose 1.5% percent of our muscle mass per year. So what I tell um, my patients is that it's, it, it doesn't matter quite so much in terms of your function when you're say, I don't know, 45 to 46, right? Um, Cause you still have some muscle mass reserve from earlier in life, particularly if you've exercised at, um, um, a lot if you were very active when you were younger. That's why physical education programs are so important in our schools. Um, you can still function and do everything that you want to, but let's say you are now 87 and going on 88. And if you haven't exercised in all those years and you have this cumulative effect of muscle mass loss, then you start having a hard time doing everyday activities like getting uh, out of bed, going up a flight of stairs, um, bending over and picking something up off the floor. And that's where it can um, uh, get dangerous. So um, I want to discuss here this muscle mass loss. So sarcopenia is defined as a loss of muscle tissue. It's type two, type two muscle fibers, the fast twitch muscles that give us power that has been proved to be directly related to function. So we lose these fast twitch muscle fibers um, naturally as we age. So things like walk, we walk a little slower, um, our grip strength isn't um, as quite as strong, getting up out of a chair becomes harder. Um, and it's, it's calculated by the formula, first calculated by the formula. Um, it's the muscle mass divided by the height squared. That's less than two standard deviations of this normal reference group. That's, um, I think it was 18 to 40. Um, and it was determined that um, uh, about 55% of men 74 years were, and older were sarcopenic and about 52% of women were sarcopenic over the age of 80. And so why does this happen? Well, I mean, there are some neurosystem um, uh, issues, physiological changes that happen, like you have less motor neurons, there are hormonal changes, inflammatory responses, um, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so what happens um, as we age here with the loss of muscle mass is that um, our mass gets less and our fat gets more. So it changes our body chemistry. Also, our bones become less, less dense. Um, so this chemistry also, that's why um, uh, uh, pharmacology needs to be studied in the geriatric population because our body chemistry is different um, from the, the younger population. So that's the bad news. And now I'm gonna introduce you to some outliers um, so that you can, you can see you know, what is possible. Um, this gentleman um, is from Arizona. He's a World War II veteran and he um, demolished the bench, bench press world. possible, right? This is not where you start. Um, we'll talk about that too, but um, I just want to give you all um, lots and lots of not just hope, but evidence that this, this um, can, can change. All right, let's talk about the physical effects of aging on our flexibility. Um, so it is um, no secret um, that there is a ch change in joint mobility as we age. We basically have less extension in general. We're more flexed. Um, so our, our spine tends to flex more. Our hips tend to extend less. Um, our, we dorsiflex or um, it's harder to bring our, our toes up to our nose. 
Um, and um, this is due um, to um, the changes in connective tissue. It's less elastic. Um, we have less water in our, in our bodies. Um, and our joints, all of us will have degeneration of our joints if we're lucky enough to have a long life. And um, the bone um, architecture changes and our bones become less dense. And um, I want to introduce you to someone um, um, who is, I don't want to embarrass her. I can't see you, Wendy, but I think you're out there. Um, this is my, my colleague who I think is a superstar. She um, uh, studied hyperkyphosis, which is the flexed, um, uh, severely flexed posture. And what she um, um, determined with a randomized control trial of 99 patients here at UCSF is that by strengthening your back, getting postural awareness, um, that you, the Cobb angle, which is the radiographic um, determination, the gold standard of how flexed your spine is, that your Cobb, Cobb angle decreases. So, I mean, in essence, these people um, got taller. Um, but what's really important, well, also their back strength increase. So this is an exercise um, program that, that we still do here at UCSF. It's called Stand Tall. I'm leading it virtually now on Tuesday mornings. And um, <clears throat> what's important for, for me, the most important thing is the function and the perceived quality of life of these um, subjects um, uh, improve significantly. Um, now I'm going to introduce you to another outlier um, for flexibility, and um, uh, this is a ballerina in Norway. She's um, still um, uh, uh, dancing. Um, she's not performing anymore. She's going to give a performance when she's 100. Um, <laughs> but she um, uh, began dancing at the age of six, and her um, first professional performance when she was 15, um, was in 1945, and she still um, trains every day um, to this day. All right, um, so going around the wheel again, um, let's talk about what happens to our bodies as we age. Well, um, there are multifactorial reasons why our balance decreases. Um, the somatosensory system, um, um, light touch, perception, even vibration um, sense to um, decreases, which is a problem, especially in our feet. Um, um, our eyesight is, uh, has decreases um, in its acuity and sensitivity and the perception of how far and close things are. And um, our inner ear, um, our vestibular um, system, um, there are hair cells in our inner ear, and um, we um, lose those hairs and nerve fibers, and our reflexes um, are slower, and our coordination is less. Um, the timing of our muscles um, is something that we look um, at, at as well in our, in our clinic, um, uh, balance reactions, and there's increased uh, co-contraction, so we're a little stiffer. And then the psychosocial um, piece of this is fear, and um, you really can't underestimate fear because if you are afraid of moving, then you will move less. And what happens when you move less is that um, you decrease your physical activity, and then there's this whole of things that happen um, when, when we move less. So uh, we do have some patient reported outcome measures that um, that measure fear, and that's something that we um, uh, base our goals on too. All right, so that is the bad news. Um, however, let me introduce you to um, this gentleman. Um, he uh, was born in, in Scotland, and he um, was a gymnast. Um, but he began um, exercising as a gymnast when he was 20 years old. And he was a fireman um, his whole life until he retired. And he um, exercised until um, way into his, his 80s. 
So here he is at 82 doing something that I've never been able to do, which is pretty awesome. Um, all right, so now let's talk about what happens as we age um, with our aerobic capacity or oxygen consumption. Well, our lungs and our blood vessels um, tend to stiffen, they're, they're less elastic. Um, and there's also some physical changes also. Um, for example, like our rib cage is a little bit tighter, we're a little bit more stooped, there's less rib, uh, lung expansion because our ribs are, are tighter. Um, to we have also um, uh, decreased extension, so we don't move quite, quite as much and we can't train quite so hard. Um, uh, but what happens with the cardiac output, which is the um, heart rate times the systolic volume, um, the, the cardiac output declines due to um, decreases in, in both the heart rate and the stroke volume. And then the atrial venous oxygen difference um, also um, changes. The oxygen is delivered just a little bit slower, and there's many reasons why um, um, that can happen to impair, impair the oxygen delivery. So again, that is the bad news. However, the good news um, is um, here's a gentleman who, will, who ran a marathon, um, a sub three minute, there he is. Um, I think this is in Vancouver. Um, he's a, he's a, a Canadian, but English born um, gentleman who ran a sub four hour marathon. Um, uh, anyway, at 73, um, he ran a sub three hour marathon. So everything is possible. It's interesting to note also that he was a, he, he did do cross country when he was um, a teenager. So he ran in some sort of organized um, uh, club. Um, but then he stopped um, and then he picked it up again when he was, he was um, 40. So, um, and this next graph is a graph from the, Nash, the uh, National Council on Aging. Um, they are, have a wealth of information on their website. Um, but as we age, um, it's very common to have chronic conditions. At least 80% of people over the age of 65 will have at least one chronic condition. And as you can see here, most of them are vascular. Um, uh, so um, some orthopedic, but mostly vascular. And 68% have two or more chronic conditions. But remember, optimal aging is in spite of these conditions. So, all right. Um, so now let's move on to talking about um, what I do every day, um, and this is um, function and fitness testing in, in older adults. Um, I find this really, um, really fun and rewarding. Um, so the IC, we use the ICF model every day, which is the International Classification of Functional Disability and Health. It was established in 2001 by the World Health Organization. And instead of looking at someone and their disease, we look at them in a different framework. So we're looking at their structures, what are their activities, and what is their um, participation. And as physical therapists, um, when um, patients come to us, this is what we um, look at and um, how we establish our goals together with the, with the patients. So um, for for body structures, we're looking at their strength, their aerobic endurance, their flexibility, um, power and speed and agility, um, and activities. We're looking at how they walk. We um, do a lot of gait analysis, um, uh, stair climbing, um, how they do things like reaching their upper body, um, getting down to the floor, and even sports. And then participation. Um, is really what makes their quality of life um, improve. So you can do errands without thinking about it, housework without a problem, laundry, gardening, um, participate in um, uh, sports and clubs and travel. That's what we really, really want. Um, and as PTs, we use um, both um, performance-based measures and self-reported measures. So performance-based measures um, our testing that a lot of them we can do in telehealth as well. And self-reported measures 
are things such as um, uh, question, there are questionnaires that we ask, for example, like I said, um, the fear, the fear, fear of falling, but also how difficult is it for you to do, um, to climb stairs and um, things like that. Uh, so there are lots, there are, I'd say thousands of tools. This is just one of them. This one's typically used in inpatient for um, patients that are at a lower, lower level. And, you know, it only takes a few minutes and it's free, it's easy to do. Um, this one you um, happen to score um, um, zero to three on each of these different items. You add them together and a score less than 20 indicates um, some sort of disability. And this is what we build our, our goals off on. Um, what I use a lot in the clinic is um, this uh, uh, senior fitness test manual. Um, it was developed by two physical therapists from um, Cal State Fullerton. And um, the age and gender norms for different uh, testing has been um, validated. And physical fitness, um, how they define it is um, the capacity to perform everyday activities safely and independently um, without um, extra fatigue. So this is quality of life for me. Um, this is how we can determine every day um, the, um, how easy it is for you to do the different things. Now I'm going to take you around the wheel, and some of these we're going to um, I want you to participate in. Um, I can't see you all. <laughs> I can't see the 223 of you all. So what I'd like for you to do is to make sure that you have a chair um, that is um, firmly on the ground and that you have like heavy furniture around that you can um, hold on to if needed because I want you to be really safe. Um, the first test that I'm gonna take you through is called the chair stand test. And um, what I'd like for you to do is to um, sit on the very end of your chair do not use your arms. So cross your arms across your chest. And then when I say go, and I'm gonna time you, there's two tests for this. One is the five times sit to stand, and the other one is a 30 second sit to stand. Um, and um, uh, I'm gonna do the 30 second sit to stand. So what I'd like for you to do is to stand up if you're um, comfortable doing this with your feet apart and knees apart and stand up and sit down as fast as you can all the way up and then tap down with your bottom okay on your mark get set and go I want you to count out loud wherever you are because i believe you're all muted and i'm counting now stand up and sit down and stand up and sit down as fast as you can so you have 10 seconds left, five, four, three, two, one, and rest. Okay, very good. All right, so remember that number, you might wanna jot it down somewhere because I'm gonna show you a chart later. Um, and this little test, which is easy to do and it only takes 30 seconds, is um, linked to functional independence and mortality. Um, so if you think about it, um, it is, these are the muscles that it takes to do things like climb stairs, um, getting out of a toilet, getting off a toilet, getting out of a car. Um, uh, so anyway, this is very important um, to your function, All right? Another test um, that we also do in the clinic that um, you won't be able to do because this one um, uh, incorporates the weight is um, for, it's an arm curl test for upper body strength. So um, for men, it's an eight pound weight. For women, it's a five pound weight. And it's how many times in 30 seconds can you do a full arm curl? And again, there's age and gender norms for that. And um, the elbow flexors are used with everyday activities like um, 
carrying groceries, picking up your grandchildren, um, lifting suitcases, which I want for everyone in our in our near future um, to be able to travel that that um, that type of thing. All right. So, what kind of tests do we do in the clinic for flexibility? Um, uh, the chair sit and reach test. So um, let's all do that. We won't be able to measure this is in inches, but um, just so that you get an idea of what you do is that you put your um, middle fingers together, um, sit on the very edge of your chair, and then you reach towards your toe. And then I measure how many inches away from the toe or you know, beyond the toe that you are. And again, there are age and gender norms. So with that particular test, um, this is a good um, uh, way to determine, um, you know, if you can put on your shoes, if you can reach down to the floor, um, that kind of thing. And then the other one um, that we do for flexibility is also this, it's this back um, scratch test, or also called athletes um, test where you put your hands behind you and you try to reach your fingertips together um, and you measure from fingertip to, to fingertip. Um, so that's important because things like combing your hair, um, putting on your clothes, um, even like reaching for the seatbelt, things like that, um, uh, you can um, determine the difficulty in doing things like that. Right now, let's move on to balance. How do we test for, for balance? Um, so the number one that we do in the clinic is this timed up and, and go test. And it's validated for eight feet, but also for three meters. And it's a, it's a, it's a task that requires you know, maneuvering agility. So um, uh, what we do is we have the person sit in a chair, and then when we say go, we time them as they, we have a cone in the clinic, they walk around a cone and then they, they sit down, um, and the cone is three meters away. And um, less than 14 seconds is a, is a determinant of a fall risk. And people can use assisted devices with this as well, we just note that, and we also, um, um, uh, if they use their arms on their on the chair, um, we will do that too. Um, and um, anyway, that's a really very common one that we do. But we also test balance with um, uh, in different ways too. Um, this one is from this uh, the CDC um, uh, website, and this is another really good web. The elderly accidents, deaths, and injuries um, website. So fall prevention, um, and um, there's some really um, east in there. One of them is a tug also, and um, uh, this balance test. So I'd like for you all to um, to do to do this one. So if you can all stand up. Um, so the first test is to stand nice and tall. Um, and have something around you so that, I'm sorry, I'm too tall for this monitor, <laughs> but I want you to put your hands on, on something with your feet touching each other and want you to let go for about 10 seconds. So go ahead and let go now. Great, and stop, All right? And then if they can do that, we move to the next test. And that's placing one instep of your foot, um, touching the big toe of the other. And you can pick whatever foot you want and then have them touching. And I'm gonna, um, I want you to let go when I say go. Ready, set, and go. Great, and stop. All right, and then this one is um, really important. This one is called the tandem stance. It's with one heel touching the toe. You can pick whatever foot you want, um, on, uh, one right in front of the other. And 
Let's start now. Go ahead and let go. And stop. Now, if that was hard for you to do and you had to touch down, then um, that is our um, our uh, barrier, the the um, the threshold to risk. Now let's try standing on one foot and we'll just do one. So whichever one is your dominant foot, go ahead, let's do the dominant foot. Ready, set, go. And stop. Yep, so if you were able to stand on one foot without touching um, using your hands um, to keep you upright, then um, you're doing very well. Um, and um, this one, I that last test, um, which is the harder test, and I do both sides also. Your non-dominant side is typically harder. Um, and we're usually all a little asymmetrical, so um, don't worry about that. But um, I use that for determining um, assisted devices to whether there's a need for assisted device. All right, let's talk about oxygen consumption and how I um, how I test for that in the clinic. And um, uh, we do with this little wheel, um, we um, do a six minute walk test. And so uh, what we do is we this is just to assess the um, oxygen endurance and capacity is that we take the blood pressure and the heart rate oxygen saturation and perceived rate of exertion. And I will discuss that with you later, what that is. Um, and the aim of this test is to walk as, as far as possible in six minutes. And um, uh, you can stop during the test if you feel like you need to rest, but you the, the clock keeps counting. And then um, there are age and gender um, norms um, for different diagnoses and also um, uh, community um, dwellers too. But something that I do on telehealth to measure the um, aerobic capacity is this two minute step test. And what you do <clears throat> is you uh, march in place and the distance from the floor um, is important. It's between um, your, um, your iliac crest and your, um, the distance between the iliac crest and the patella. And then right in the middle there, um, I have, um, the patient like put a piece of tape on the wall and then they march in place as fast as they can. And I always count the right leg and see how many times you can do that. Again, there's age and gender norms for that. And that's something where you can see the differences. So now, with your test, your chair stand test, this is for men. Um, so um, if you can find your age and how many chair stands you did, you can see if you fall within the normal here, um, or if you um, have some, some work to do and you need to um, increase your leg strength. And then this is the same um, for, for women. Um, the age and gender norms for women too. So find your age and see how many you did and see how you measure up, right? Um, and I would be remiss to not mention um, gait speed. Um, this is from a what, um, uh, um, it's a journal article called um, uh, Walking Speed, um, the sixth vital sign. And the premise is, you know, we typically test blood pressure and heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and, and the patient's pain levels, but we don't measure gait speed. And gait speed tells us a lot. Um, it's a very reliable, sensitive, um, specific uh, test to do. Um, and it's super easy to do. Um, we, in the clinic, um, we typically use, it's validated for different distances, but a 10 meter span. So we allow people to um, kind of walk for five meters at their normal comfortable speed. And then we measure them 
um, right at 10 meters, and then they have basically a, a cool down. Um, and it is linked to people's function. So you <clears throat> are um, uh, a fall risk if um, you're less than one uh, meter per second. So that is usually the threshold um, in the clinic or what we're trying, trying to, um, to uh, um, so, you know, 0.6 meters per second, um, you, if you're less than that, you are dependent in your activities of daily living, um, and you are in the community, a limited community ambulator. Um, at 0.8, you're right on the threshold of being a limited community ambulator and being a community ambulator. So it gets easier for you to do things like shop or walk to your friend's house, um, things like that. Um, we shoot for 1.2 um, because at that point um, you are um, uh, you can cross streets um, and that's a, a normal walking speed. So this is something also um, that we measure in the clinic. So now you see some of the things that we do here, um, but how do you know when to see a physical therapist or when it's merited? Um, so here are some questions to ask yourself. It's like, how many times do you leave your house um, in the course of a week? Um, has there been any change in your ability to do things recently? And then that fear factor also that I've mentioned before is, um, are, are you afraid of falling? Um, these are things to talk to your um, doctor about uh, that we may be able to help you. All right, so now let's talk about some guidelines for physical activity for people over the age of 65 and over. And this is um, resoundingly in agreement across these different agencies like the CDC, the American College of Sports Medicine, the American Heart Association, the World Health Org and the World Health Organization. Um, but what is interesting to me um, as a geriatric specialist is that um, people over the age of 18 and the over the age of 65, there is no difference. So the, the guidelines are the same with the exception that there's a few more guidelines for older the age of 65, which include flexibility and balance. So let's talk about what those are. Um, so uh, let's talk about strength. Um, so what is um, recommended um, for strengthening? And here our model is Sam Jett. She is a Mount Zion physical therapist. She is an orthopedic clinical, clinical specialist and she's modeling the leg press. So what's recommended for strengthening is a minimum of two days a week um, uh, and it's moderate to high intensity. So moderate intensity is um, your own perception of what moderate is, and it is reliable. Um, so um, one repetition maximum is how, how, you, if, how much weight you can, for example, the I'll do biceps um, because a demonstration because that's um, probably the easiest thing to to, uh, to show here, but one repetition maximum is keeping your form, um, what weight you can lift one time with keeping your form at the maximum, but they want 70% RPMs. So that means that you're really tired at about 10 to 15 repetitions. So you really do have to um, work get you know work it's 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 a lot of work and it's safe for older adults um what's important with the um strengthening if you're going to do weights or machines is um uh, a couple of things one is you know how to how to do the actual movement and the second is that you avoid overflow in other words you keep your form so in the same um, example of a bicep curl. So let's say I have this weight here and um, I can do it with good form um, with say 20 pounds. 
However, if I am doing it with 40 pounds and I'm um, bending like this and really um, recruiting other muscles, substituting is what we call it, um, then um, that's not good for you. So you need to keep your spine in neutral position. So ears over your shoulders, shoulders over your hips and isolate the muscle and be able to isolate the muscle um, with good form. So that's why a mirror is, is really important, but really feeling and being aware of your, of your position in space, right? Um, all right, so now let's talk about the guidelines for flexibility. What is recommended? And here we have one of my colleagues, um, Jocelyn. She works at the, with the students um, at the University of Berkeley and she's demonstrating flexibility. And what is recommended is to perform exercises um, at least two days a week for 10 minutes. Um, and um, so it's not a lot of time, but what does that look like? Well, it could be, you know, um, simple stretches of your shoulder, um, of your hamstrings, of your quadriceps. Um, again, keeping this neutral spine idea so that you don't hurt yourself. Um, if you, you know, like yoga, um, that's a possibility too, or any kind of stretching exercise program online, and I'll discuss some of those and some free resources I'll give you at the very end also. Um, but um, that, that is at least two days a week. All right, so let's talk about balance and coordination. And here I have some of my esteemed colleagues. These are um, uh, physical therapy aides in our gym, and they, at, they were at Mission Bay. And um, I'm happy to say that all of them are in the physical therapy um, doctorate program. Some, I think one has graduated already um, and they're demonstrating um, balance and coordination. So daily balance exercises um, and coordination exercises. So what is that and what does that look like? Um, if you like Tai Chi, Tai Chi has been shown, there's a lot of evidence in, in my world um, of uh, the benefits of Tai Chi to reduce falls to the tune of like 37%. Um, uh, but it can be as simple as, you know, um, after you brush your teeth, just to stand on one leg and see if you can let go. And you can even do, you know, dynamic um, uh, static standing um, like this um, too. Um, and, uh, or it could be, um, putting on a Zumba Gold um, exercise class online. And, um, uh, you know, if that's something that interests you. Um, so dancing, um, moving, um, you know, doing some sort of stepping, stepping exercise um, at least daily, right? And now let's talk about oxygen consumption. And here we have Pilar and she is in our Mission, Mission Bay Clinic here on the treadmill. And what's recommended is moderate intensity aerobic activity. So it's sustained movement for 150 minutes a week. So that equates to about 30 minutes, five days a week, or if it's vigorous intensity, and I'll um, tell you what that is, um, 75 minutes a week. But this is not where you start, right? This is where, this is what is recommended. So it's building up to this um, and uh, um, getting past that hump where you're able to do this um, for your overall health. So I'm going to show you here that this um, Borg rate of perceived exertion. Sometimes it's on a scale of six to twenty. I use one to ten. So one is you know you're sitting in a chair what you're all doing right now that would be a one in terms of perceived exertion 10 is that you're going so hard that you're you can't talk and you you're you're going to need to stop really soon so what's recommended for moderate is about a about a five so that means you can still talk but maybe at the end of the sentences 
you need to, you know, take a breath. You're a little bit uncomfortable. And you can, if you have a friend with you and you're talking, you would be talking like this. So walking at a little bit of a clip. And vigorous is just a little bit more than that. You would, if you ask yourself and you think about it, you are a little bit, um, you are more out of breath. So if you are talking to a friend, then you sometimes mid-sentence, you have to take a, take a breath, but you can speak full sentences like just like this. So it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more. And this is um, uh, linked to, um, you know, things like um, heart rate and blood pressure. Now, I really like this graph a lot um, because it tells us how, how incredible the health benefits are, particularly if you are um, frail and deconditioned. There is definitely a dose response relationship between physical activity and your overall health status. So on this y-axis is um, um, the risk for chronic diseases and mortality. And on the x-axis is the, um, how, how fit you are. And if you are on the low end of the spectrum and um, inactive and lots of chronic diseases, um, then just a little bit of exercise is going to change a lot. Um, with with um, with your overall physical health, um, so there is a um, it's a it, it's really important that you know even short bouts and low volumes volumes of like you know walking or jogging um, can really make marked benefits um, in your over overall health. So um, there is, as you see, the more fit you are. Um, the more you have to do in order to change. So there is um, a, a little bit of a ceiling effect and then there's no effect at all. So um, anyway, um, go for, I say, um, keep working at it. Yeah. So I just want to point this out that um, uh, exercise isn't recommended, you know, um, as much as it really should. Um, it's, it's very effective and typically it's, it's under, uh, you know, under trained, people are under trained in older adults. Um, you want to try to match, you know, what you can do and notice that a little bit of, little bit of, um, difference in your physical activity can make huge, huge, um, health benefits. And then um, this is my piece um, in that um, enjoyment really is one of the predictors of behavioral change. You really do need to enjoy what you're doing. If I tell someone to join an exercise class and they don't like you know, being in an exercise class, they'd rather be outside. Well, I tell them, you know, I'm interested in you now and I want you to get better now, but I'm also thinking about you 30 years from now and where, where you're at. Let's try to find something that you enjoy doing um, that is sustainable. And I also tell people, especially those that are recently retired, that their new job should be to exercise and take care of your body because that will determine your quality of life um, in, your, in your retirement. So I'm going to give you here, a, sorry for the busy slide here, a patient example of someone that I saw in telehealth that is, you know, um, not uncommon to what I typically see. Um, this is a, um, a patient who lives in, she lives um, in the in-law unit. So her daughter lives up above with, with, um, with all of her um, family and um, she's 84 years old. She has a history of a total knee replacement um, a while back, um, in early 2000s, back surgery. Her hypertension is controlled, and she does have a history of depression. Um, because of the pandemic sheltering in place, she has been homebound. She is very afraid of, of um, getting COVID. Um, and she used to go with her daughter every week to the grocery store and she'd help her with the meals. And there was a church four blocks away and she would go 
um, every day to, to church. Um, but because of the pandemic, she hasn't um, left, she didn't, and this was a couple months ago, she hadn't left her house in a month. Um, but here, this was pretty much a red flag for me, is when I asked her about how much of her waking hour she spends in bed, and she spends a lot of time in bed watching television. And what she's noticed over the months of the pandemic, and this is very real, it um, happens to many of my patients as they have trouble doing things. So she had um, difficulty going up the stairs. So she's not participating so with, the, with the meals um, with her family. And she used to walk without an assistant advice within the house. And um, when she'd go out to um, with her daughter grocery shopping or um, go um, uh, um, to medical appointments, she'd use a cane. But now she's using a front wheel walker when she does go out, which isn't frequently. Um, very infrequently, and she's needing a cane inside the house because she has knee pain. So her knee, her uninvolved knee, the one that didn't have the total knee replacement, she rated it about a six out of 10 with stairs. So I, I tested her range of motion. I tested her sit to stands in 30 seconds, and she could do it five times in, in, um, in 30 seconds. And then um, I did the balance test, and she's just, she's a fall risk. She hadn't fallen, but she's a fall risk. She's right on the cusp. And then I watched her walk online and I could see how she had her antalgic gait. Um, she had a bit of a Trendelenburg um, and I watched her go up and, down the, uh, up and down the stairs too and how she maneuvered, how she, she, um, she held on. I saw that she was safe with how she was doing it. Um, but I gave her some other suggestions to give her more confidence and, um, and less pain. So what did I do with her? So um, the first time um, she's lovely and, the, and very open to suggestions. So I um, had her purchase a little exercise bike that you can get um, for 25 bucks. Um, and it's just the pedals of a bicycle. And um, I had her bring it to the, to the chair and we started with 10 minutes. She didn't have any knee pain with that. And she's getting circulation um, to, her, to her legs. And then um, I had her um, increase her upright tolerance. So um, slowly and gradually increase her time that she was up, spending less time in bed and more upright, whether that's sitting for her sitting all day would have been an exercise, it's a lot of exercise, it's a lot of work, she got very tired. So getting up in the morning and then getting up in the afternoon. And then I also got her on a walking program, which was um, after she used the bathroom to pace around her house, um, or in, in, she lived in the in-law unit with a garage, so she would walk around for about five minutes after she used the bathroom, which gives you a lot of standing time. Um, which is really very good. And I had her journal that, which she was like super, super good at. Um, and then as time went on, I gave her exercises. Um, I gave her a rubber band um, in the mail and we would do exercises online. And um, her legs, in particular, her hip, her right hip was really weak. So um, uh, if in the hip, um, knee pain typically reduces. Um, and so um, she was feeling a lot better with that. And then as time went on, I encouraged her to go up um, uh, twice a day for meals. Um, and then with her grandkids who lived upstairs um, to go for a walk with them um, outside first with a with the walker um, and just to the end of the street um, and and um, and back. So um, we made lots and lots of progress. And um, by the end, um, she was going up for um, meals, um, her two meals a day um, upstairs. So her daughter was, um, and she was helping prep meals and um, um, helping out with very limited household duties, but um, she was really on a very good path. So physical activity and increasing her physical activity really did change her quality of life. All right, and again, I just want to revisit here this optimal aging um, and its definition and um, to function across your physical, 
self, your cognitive health, which physical activity um, uh, definitely improves um, cognition, your emotional well being, which physical activity definitely improves um, social, so that you can uh, much more easily get together with others um, to life satisfaction, to one satisfaction. So um, optimal aging is improving your quality of life. All right, so in summary, um, uh, we talked about all these different things, how physical activity um, and sedentary behavior affects, affects you and the normal effects of, of aging, but knowing that um, exercise is a powerful modifier to all of these. And we did some testing and um, functional tests, and uh, we talked about some guidelines of where we can start. So my question for you all is really, why isn't exercise prescribed as medicine more often? And, um, and are we under training our older adults? And the answer to um, that question is a resounding, resounding yes. Um, and I wanna, also give you um, uh, some resources, and this is not, uh, um, this is limitless really. Um, there's a long, long list of free resources out in the community. Um, Choose PT has um, free videos online, um, as well as um, Go, Go for Life. Um, those are um, uh, um, online as well. Um, sit and be fit, that is um, exercise classes. They're about 25 minutes. It's run by this um, a lovely nurse. They're all, all, um, you know, all kinds of exercises. You do um, upper extremity, lower extremity, um, but she does get out of the chair and do some balance exercises too. Always Active is a wonderful, um, now it's online, but it used to be in 18 different centers throughout San Francisco um, in mostly senior centers, but also community centers and churches. And it was um, started by a kinesiology professor, Chris Thompson at US, USF. And um, it's an exercise class they meet every day online. It's live streamed. And there's also some uh, balance classes too, a couple days a week. And Silver Sneakers is a, is a if you're not familiar with that, it's a really um, good program for, um, you get free memberships in different gyms um, wherever, wherever you live. So I encourage you um, wherever you're living to look for um, free resources because they are out there. And with that, I wanna thank you all. And um, I am open for questions. That was great, Kathy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I do have a, a few questions that I'm just going to uh, run through here. Um, I have a, there's an individual that uh, has osteoporosis, and they they have fallen um, several times. Um, they did have spinal surgery. Um, since then, they haven't fallen. Um, they do go swimming and walk in the water for about 150 minutes each week. They're still fearful of falling. How can they gain their confidence and balance back? Yeah. So um, with osteoporosis, um, uh, weight bearing exercises are indicated to help improve um, uh, bone, bone density. So what that means is um, things like um, walking, um, you know, uh, jogging would be ideal, even jogging, right? Um, um, any kind of um, upright, upright exercise. So, um, so getting them more upright um, is important. Swimming is great for your muscles. And um, with osteoporosis, you wanna you know, strengthen the back extensors, but it's not a weight bearing exercise. So it needs to be supplemented with something else. So I would um, start with uh, strength training and um, find where they're, um, weaknesses are and then work on those. So it's very interesting, like for example, your hip muscles. If your hip is weak, it affects your balance directly. Um, so by strengthening your hip muscles, 
you will get more balance and therefore more confidence. Um, also, um, if they are having um, lack of confidence, um, just walking, um, things like you know hiking poles, um, will it increases your base of support so that you can move much freer, um, starting on flat surfaces and then moving towards you know hilly and uneven terrain but starting on flat surfaces. So it's where you start. But what's really important for osteoporosis is this neutral spine con concept that I've also introduced, which is you know keeping your ears over your shoulders, shoulders over your hips, and being as upright as possible for optimal bone health, and um, then strengthening in that position. So there are things you can't do when you're fearful, right? But there are so many things that you can do um, and if you do not wait there, then um, the, of course there's medications that will help um, increase the um, bone density, not necessarily the architecture, but the bone density. Um, uh, so weight bearing exercise to get those osteoblasts working um, to, um, to keep the person safe. Because if they fall, they are at a higher risk of of fracturing. So it's finding all the things that you you can do and how to do them safely and know that you really must move with osteoporosis. And then in, in terms of you know uh, injuries such as like a, a foot injury, how would you uh, you know what would you recommend to safely get back to long walks and occasional jog jogging? Yeah. So um, for um, you can start, um, you can still, your arms are still strong. You know, when you're injured, sometimes we have the psychology of, well, what I, what I can't do, like I mentioned before, but what can you do? Well, um, you can do upper body strengthening. Um, you can, even with a foot injury, um, likely because you're weight bearing less, um, ride a bicycle. So, you know, um, a stationary bike, or um, it's called the restorator, this, um, this bikeless pedals um, on the ground um, to get your heart rate going. Um, you can, now that pools are starting to open, you can swim also, um, but you can strengthen your bones and your hips. Um, uh, but what I would say is you got to um, promote the healing of, of the foot. So having, um, uh, uh, adequate shoe wear um, is important, something that's not going to irritate you and um, starting slowly. So something like, you know, the sit and be fit class would be ideal because you're sitting and you're strengthening um, and you're built, you're increasing your heart rate um, from a very, you know, um, unloaded, un unloaded your, of your foot position. Uh, this is kind of a comment, but uh, it would be helpful to have the gait speed chart converted to match an iPhone. Uh, do you know uh, maybe something that uh, that how would? How many miles per hour? So the gait speed, you can figure out how many miles per hour are the different um, uh, you know meters per second. Um, so that's an equation, and I and I believe that there are on some apps um, miles per hour. Um, on there, just like on a treadmill. Um, so, um, goodness, uh, some running, some running apps may have them. I, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't have them. But you can try different apps for finding the miles per hour um, okay. on there. Mm -hmm. So okay, and then uh, the SB in the PA slash SB. What does that stand for again? Oh, sedentary behavior, sorry. Oh, okay. And physical yes. activity, I apologize. I should have I should have made that a little bit more clear. So uh, physical see. activity and, and sedentary behavior. Let's see, what tests should we have done before moving to a more uh, demanding, vigorous, uh, more than um, seven RPEs um, exercise regimen? Say that one more time. I'm sorry. What? Uh, the what tests should we have done before moving to a more demanding, vigorous exercise regimen? And then they have greater than seven uh, RPEs. 
they they missed the first few minutes. So, so rate of perceived exertion. Yes. So so um, so I think they're talking about the Borg exertion scale, the RPEs zero uh, or one being sitting in a chair and ten being working so hard that you feel like you need to stop. Um, so um, keep it at a seven. Um, there is no need to um, to uh, go go higher than that. You will increase your physical fitness um, uh, working vigorously. <laughs> so it's moderately hard, and um, that's safe and effective and um, proven to increase your um, aerobic endurance. Uh, so this individual was a uh, part of the posture study at UCSF that you mentioned, and it was very helpful. Um, can anyone join the virtual stand class you mentioned, or is it current for current PT patients only? No, it's not. It's it's community based. Oh, awesome. um, yeah, we did them at the Backard Center in Mission Bay, um, but now with the shelter in place, we closed the gym, and we're doing them virtually. And absolutely, it doesn't, you don't need to have a referral. Um, if you contact the, um, you can look up UCSF um, Physical Therapy Stand Tall. If you Google that, um, you'll be able to find us there and get more information. Give us a call and a coordinator will be happy to talk to you. Um, any recommendations for an 85-year-old woman uh, using a stationary exercise bike? Yeah, so make sure you go at a clip. Challenge yourself. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, keep using the stationary bike. Now, I also am a believer in multimodal exercise. So it's not just um, doing the same thing every day all the time. Challenge yourself. The way to challenge yourself is to, there's three ways. One of them is increasing your repetitions so um, in, uh, with bicycling, it would be to go a little bit longer in terms of time. You can also change your resistance. Um, so it would be you know, putting a little bit more, more tension or um, if you're doing weights, then increasing your weights. And then the third one is to decrease your stability. So um, that would mean, um, for example, um, using some sort of like uneven surface like um, doing lunges outside, um, you know, where on the pavement where it's just a little bit more uneven, or if you're doing things indoors and you need to have that firm surface, just um, using your um, fingertips on the wall and um, starting starting from there, maybe two walls and doing it down a hallway and then changing so that you're doing the exercise on, on one like that. So you're decreasing your stability because that creates more um, co-contraction of your muscles, um, and it gets you better. So you got to change it up a little bit and um, continue on. I think that's great. That's great. Um, how effective are uh, vestibular exercises? I think I'm pronouncing that. Uh -huh. So um, uh, vestibular re rehab is a thing. Um, it is a, um, uh, a, a discipline that people you, there are certified um, vestibular rehab um, therapists, of which we have several. Typically, they're um, neurological physical therapists. Um, uh, that's a different board certification than what I have. And um, very effective. Yeah, so if you have vestibular problem, especially, you know, if you're dizzy and um, you just don't move so much, right, because you're afraid to move, and then that fear factor um, occurs and then you do lose your physical activity um, and you um, become less fit. So I would encourage you if that is is a problem, it decreases falls and um, improves, improves your your fitness in general to have vestibular rehab across the lifespan. Uh, does estrogen help build bones? So it does, um, but I have to say that, um, you know, it's beyond my scope in terms of um, hormone replacement therapy. Um, so I cannot speak to that, um, but I can tell you that um, as, uh, you know, the estrogen as what happens um, up until menopause, um, we maintain our bone. 
So um, the problem um, after menopause is when our, our estrogen decreases and then um, that affects our bone density. Um, so the question then is, what do you do to improve your, your um, bone density? And um, weight-bearing exercises, um, that's what you do. Um, uh, postural awareness, um, strengthening, um, and weight-bearing exercises um, will help um, people with osteoporosis. And that, um, um, and people, um, everybody really, and we will all lose estrogen, by the way. Um, so um, it is a, also a natural part of, of aging. And then we, we did talk a lot about um, exercise, but do you have suggestions on a diet to build muscle or would that be a separate session? Yeah, so that is a separate session. However, um, let me speak to that um, in that um, as we age, we need to eat more protein. Um, I believe it's 1.2 grams per kilogram of protein. Um, then that increases um, as we age. So um, just to make sure that you have, you know, with the, with the um, actual um, energy that it takes in order to um, exercise, you know, um, leafy fruits and vegetables, um, adequate amount of fluid intake, um, and then particularly this, this protein piece too is sometimes lacking with, with the diet. But um, yeah, that's a whole other hour and a half discussion. <laughs> uh, let's see, I'm going to group these two together. Um, uh, so what, what would the major muscle groups uh, be, you know, for somebody that is fairly fit um, and exercises throughout the week? Um, should, what should they be doing for all around strength? And then also um, someone dealing with nerve issues, specifically in the legs, could stretching help with this? All right, so um, the, the first question about the muscle groups. So you have your upper body exercises, your lower body exercises, and your core. Um, and they can be um, grouped. So, you, you know, um, core and upper body exercises in a day and another day, um, your lower body exercises. So um, thinking about arms, what can you do? Thinking about the, um, the gyms you know, bicep, triceps, but deltoids also um, uh, strengthening, and then also um, the core, so your abs and your back extensors. So um, thing I like, I like lumbar stabilization exercises for the core, and that's without moving your spine, you're moving your arms and legs, um, like on, on your back, um, and back extensor exercises, um, even um, bridging, working your glutes, lower extremity exercises, love the leg press, don't forget your calves, and that's an important lever arm for walking, you need to have strong calves too, but know that it's all your muscle groups twice a week. So, um, this is actually another question. I'm going to group a couple together here. But so walking every day for 30 minutes, um, is, is that enough? Or it sounds like we should be adding some kind of weights. And um, let's see the one was here. Oh, at resistant bands. Are those equivalent to free weights? Yeah. So um, walking 30 minutes a day um, is good because you're getting your weight bearing, your weight bearing, right? Um, your bone building. Um, and uh, you're getting the blood circulating, but I'm gonna, you gotta keep yourself challenged. Um, so you got to progress. So are you walking a little bit faster? Maybe incorporating more hills, make it fun, um, go to different areas, go for a hike, um, that kind of thing. Again, find what you enjoy doing. Um, maybe you love to socialize and now you're both vaccinated um, and you can go for um, walks together and just challenge yourself um, and gossip a lot, do whatever you, you love to do. So um, the second question is about the stretchy band, these exercises. 
So these are great. So I worked in home health for almost a decade. And, um, you know, I basically said I have a gym in a bag um, and I go to people's houses. And there's lots and lots of things that you can do with these. The different colors correlate to different resistance types. Um, the difference between a weight and a band is that it's not as precise, right? So you really do have to think about what is moderately moderate or moderately hard for you and challenge yourself. You know, you know, I'm all full, I'm full of these, these sayings, right? These platitudes, but really you got to challenge yourself in life to get better. You always have to challenge yourself. So make it um, hard. So the way to make it harder with a band is a different color, or you can get your um, legs or arms closer together. It makes it a little bit hard, but your rate of perceived exertion should be the same and always keep your form. Well, it looks like we are out of time. I, we th again, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. That was uh, very informative and helpful. Um, there was a question in regards to this being uh, posted online. The video will be um, posted uh, and we will be sending the link out for that. And um, Kathy, are uh, any of these slides available? Um, uh, yeah, I guess the... I can make them available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we yeah. could we could talk later about that, but um, okay. and then those would be included when we send the link out. So um, thank you again. Uh, thank you. Really enjoyed that, and then we hope to see you soon. And thank you everyone for joining us today.